Welcome back to the Health Action Conference, everyone. I'm Lisa Hunter, the Senior Director for Strategic Partnerships at Families USA, and I'm so happy to have you all back. So here we are, day two. Jen Taylor, how are you feeling after yesterday? I'm pumped. I just came from the Health News Coffee Talk, so I'm fully caffeinated and motivated, ready to go. I'm choosing Wonder Woman mug for my motivation today. Lisa, what do you I got have? I my, my Star Wars mug, which is really Very cool. nice. Very nice. Um, so I think we're ready for the day. So good afternoon, everyone, uh, and good morning to our friends out west, of course. I'm Jen. I'm the Senior Director of Federal Relations here at Families USA. And after yesterday's incredible lineup from Congresswoman McBath to President Biden, that amazing health and racial justice panel, still thinking about that, uh, and ending with those inspiring calls to action from Laura and Reverend Warnock. I'm just, I'm so proud to be part of this amazing community of advocates, and I cannot wait to hear more today. And let's just start by trying to keep that good energy going. So why don't you go ahead and add your favorite part of day one in the chat, you can show some love for the people and ideas that really inspired you. Yeah, absolutely. I loved the panel. The um, the opening session panel was incredible. And I was going to say, I, I bet in the chat box right now, everybody knows the drill. Everyone's introducing themselves. But yeah, highlights from yesterday would be wonderful. So please share. And I think it's so true. I think folks are having a great time at the Health Action Conference, which is what it's all about. Um, and I was just noticing, and I think you know, a lot of people are really exploring the portal, which is wonderful. Um, and I was taking a look at the leaderboard just a few minutes ago, and I was just noticing, I think we have a lot of social butterflies, either that or we have a lot of really hyper-competitive advocates at Health Action, which is probably true, and they all really want a gift certificate to the outrage, which is great. Um, and I saw that Katie Hahn, Rebecca Hill Larson, and Jen McGarry are at the top of the leaderboard. So we'll see if they hold on to those standings for the full conference. I feel like Katie must have talked with everyone at the entire conference. I don't even know how you get 3000 points. So it's very impressive. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't think she's a bot, but like, <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's really not that surprising, Lisa. I feel like our community community is always pretty vocal. So I don't know. I think you there's a, com a couple of other things to point to uh, for some high energy look at what folks are doing in the in the platform. That's totally true. I mean, I was going to highlight also that we still have the virtual partner booths, and I know some of you are out there hyping yourselves up, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, and it's also, I think, also just not a surprise at all, like you were saying, Jen, we do have some really committed, determined advocates, and it is such an impressive and inspiring space to occupy, and we are so lucky and privileged to have, um, to belong to this community. But I did want to hype up uh, a few of the virtual booths, so if you haven't yet gone to the Engagement Hub and checked them out, um, highlighting a few here, Alex from the National Trans National Center for Transgender Equality, Lindsay from the Small Business Majority, Jack from Planned Parenthood, Stacy from the Utah Health Policy Project, and Yvonne from the California Immigrant Policy Center. So much impressive work, so many initiatives, and just to tie this back to yesterday's plenary, um, I mean, our movement is so intersectional, and just like reading those names, it really gives you a sense of how diverse and widespread our community really is, and how we are stronger when we're um, working across, uh, you know, such a diverse constituency and so many issues. So, um, but beyond the partner booths, let's look ahead to build back better. Jen, you talk to Congress all the time. What can you share with those of us at Health Action today in terms of pushing for Build Back Better? I'm gonna start with three things. Um, really, they're pretty simple and straightforward. First, we have got to re-energize this conversation in Congress. We should take this opportunity while we are all gathered here together to collectively tweet, post on social media, just get the word out any way we can to keep that pressure going and remind folks of the immense need to pass Build Back Better right now. That's great. And, you know, I love it. Check out the chat box. I know some of our colleagues are dropping in sample social media. The call to action, just to be very clear for today, is to make sure that we are pressing on our social channels on Build Back Better in order to re-energize this conversation as Jen just laid out. So what's next? Honestly, simple. Stay on message. This is a decidedly popular bill, regardless of what you hear. This is a popular bill that has lots of good things in it. It would legitimately help millions of families. 
And there are hard votes in Washington, but this is not actually one of them. This is about lowering drug costs, expanding coverage and making it more affordable, improving the health of mothers and children and families. It doesn't get any easier than that. This is a slam dunk. Hashtag facts. What's third? Third is honestly just to keep it up. You can rest when you need to rest. It has been a long slog, but don't, don't stop. Don't ever stop. In this session, we're gonna hear from really a whole slew of inspiring advocates and champions and storytellers who are gonna urge us to stay the course. They're gonna ground us in this moment and tell us why we need to keep at it. And honestly, we're here just to do that. Exactly, that sounds like a plan. What do you all think? Think we can do this? I think so. Um, so let's go ahead and turn it over to our executive director, Frederick Asasi, and the executive director of Community Catalyst, Emily Stewart, who are going to give us some brief welcome remarks. So take it away, you two. Hi, Emily. It is so good to see you again. Hi, Frederick. It looks like we're both attending Health Action Conference from our homes again. I have to say, not being able to be in person is getting pretty old. I cannot believe that it has been two years since we were able to be in the same room together. But I'm really glad that you are safe and healthy. Uh, thank you, Emily. Right back at you. And amen, this is getting very, very old. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for being a part of the conference and all the terrific work that you and the team at Community Callus do every single day. Absolutely. It is a joy to be with you. So what did you think of yesterday's lineup with President Biden and Senator Warnock and our Health Justice Advocate of the Year? It's really fantastic to be part of this community. 1,000%. It's so important for us to take the time to connect, to be inspired, and really just to simply remember that we are in this together. And I felt like yesterday's lineup did a great job of that. Uh, it reminded us that we are both a community and family. How's that for a plan words, Frederick? Fantastic. I mean, and we can all catalyze change across the USA. That that was a bit much. <laughs> I really do agree, though, that the conversation yesterday about the connection between health and racial justice was so thought-provoking. It definitely made me consider how all of our fight are united towards the same goal. It's really true. Following it up by talking about equity in workforce, equity in vaccine access, and equity in so many other areas really helped crystallize all the different ways we can have an impact. And how motivating was President Biden yesterday? I cannot wait to hear from Speaker Pelosi and Secretary Becerra this afternoon. Totally agree. And I can't wait for the networking sessions and to visit more partner booths. There were so many good conversations going on everywhere yesterday. Really, it's that important opportunity to connect with people who have only been able to connect with over email or on a phone call. That really is my favorite part of health action in, in, this, in this event. And I'm definitely coming away from this experience rejuvenated for the year ahead. The opportunity for connection, I 100% agree, is the best part. But for rejuvenation, it is really hard to beat the wellness corner. It's pretty awesome to be able to go over there, do a quick yoga practice, join little advocate story time, and then to top it off with some pretty adorable pet videos. So true. I mean, a shout out to the staff. What incredible creativity uh, they put into the conference this year to help us all connect. And if there's anything we've learned from the past two years, it's that we have to care about our mental health as much as we do our physical health, if not more. And there's so many of today's speakers have prioritized that in their work. What a nice seg into our first session. I'm so excited to hear from our lineup in the View from DC session, which is coming right up. Speaker Pelosi, Congressman Trier and Jayapal, and a whole host of members of Congress are going to give us the inside scoop. Amen. Thanks again for joining us, Emily, and wishing you a really wonderful 2022. Thanks, Frederick and Emily. Emily, I love that. Nice seg. I'm going to use that. Okay, Jen, I think we have a great lineup before us. What do you say we get to it? Sounds like a plan. I'm going to jump right in then because it is now my distinct honor to introduce Peter Morley. For more than a decade, Peter has dubbed himself a professional patient, a title he's earned the hard way managing 10 pre-existing conditions, 17 different doctors, and 38 different medications. But despite these daily challenges, he's turned to advocacy, and he's worked with government agencies, elected officials, political candidates, advocacy organizations, and the media to protect and expand healthcare for all. 
And since we're on the subject of the pet wellness videos, I do have to give a special shout out to his service dog, Angelica. She joins him in traveling around the country to meet with members of Congress and advance this critical work. So Jelly, you should check out the Wellness Corner video, Pets of Families USA, can't be missed. Peter is driven by the guiding principle that no one should ever have to worry about having their health care taken away from them, especially when they're ill. His ultimate goal is to use his platform to establish August as National Healthcare Awareness Month. And something tells me there's no stopping Peter when he's got his mind set on a goal. Peter, over to you, my friend. Thank you, Jen, for the introduction. I'm Peter Morley, and I'm a patient advocate. For more than five years now, I have been working to protect and expand healthcare for all. For me, it's personal. I live every day with lupus. I've had three failed spinal surgeries, and I have survived cancer twice. I am fighting for my own right to healthcare, but also for millions of others in every corner of this country who need and deserve access to affordable healthcare. I recently co-founded Healthcare Awareness Month, which aims to raise awareness of the work being done to improve healthcare in America, work that all of us here are doing every single day. I have traveled to Capitol Hill more times than I can count. I've testified before Congress, met with members and their staff, and raised awareness in the media. In all that time, I can tell you that there has been no bigger champion for healthcare, no better guidepost for progress than Speaker Nancy Pelosi. During her time in Congress, Speaker Pelosi has shepherded major healthcare wins that have improved our nation's health, including strengthening Medicare and Medicaid, passing the ACA, and keeping House Democrats united against the constant attacks to our healthcare system. I am proud to be one of millions of Speaker Pelosi's VIPs, that means volunteers in politics. And I'm so grateful that we have her in our corner fighting for the people as we continue the important work of improving our nation's health and healthcare. So without further ado, it is my sincere privilege to introduce Madam Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Hello. As House Speaker, it is my privilege to bring greetings from the Congress to this group of passionate healthcare advocates as you gather virtually for the annual Families USA Health Action Conference. Thank you, Peter Morley, for your introduction and for sharing your story of overcoming adversity and your powerful advocacy for patients. Stories like yours are the most eloquent illustration of the urgent need for our work in Congress. Let us also salute the strong leadership of Frederick Isasi, who brings years of policy experience to the fight for health equity. Thank you for being a leader in the fight to cut the cost of prescription drugs, especially this fight last summer when we shone a bright light on Big Pharma's outrageous price gouging alongside Chairwoman Carolyn Maloney and the Oversight Committee. Thank you, Families USA. For more than four decades, you have been a strategic partner for progress for our House Democratic Caucus in the fight for equality, affordable health care for all. You, Ron Pollack, and many others were absolutely essential from enacting and defending the Affordable Care Act to ending the devastating practice of surprise building and so much more. This year, your clarion call for health justice now is particularly timely. For too long, shameful health disparities have left far too many communities of color and low-income families behind, with zip codes often, often determining health outcomes. And as we have seen over the past two years, the COVID pandemic has only exacerbated these challenges. As our nation continues to battle the pandemic, President Biden and the Democrats in Congress are fighting to build back better, which means leaving the health and well being of no American behind. In our historic American Rescue Plan, Democrats delivered a crucial first step toward this goal as we work to crush the virus. 
This life-saving legislation made it easier to find coverage that meets families' needs at a price they can afford, helping to close disparities in coverage and saving the average family to only $2,400 last year. Indeed, it is with great pride that today we can say, thanks to Democrats' leadership, health care is more accessible and affordable than ever before. But Democrats will not relent until we achieve quality health care for all. This includes enacting our House Back Build Back Better Act, and we are committed to passing legislation that will slash the prices of prescription drugs, lower the cost of coverage on ACA exchanges, expand access to home health care services, improve maternal health outcomes, especially for black moms, close the Medicaid coverage gap by expanding the ACA to include those eligible for Medicaid in states that chose not to expand Medicaid, and so much more. And as we do so, we will honor our health care heroes, often women and women of color with more jobs, better wages, and stronger benefits. Health equity is a moral imperative, an economic imperative, and a public health imperative in our work to build a brighter, healthier future for all. On behalf of the House, thank you for your steadfast partnership in the fight to honor this essential truth. Health care is a right, not a privilege. We cannot succeed without your outside mobilization. So best wishes for a productive conference. It's always amazing to start off the day with a little inspiration from the first, but certainly not last, woman to serve as a Speaker of the House of Representatives. Extraordinary. And especially fresh off her announcement yesterday that she's planning to stay in Congress to keep up the good fight for another term. Uh, lots of exciting stuff going on. So we are going to keep this theme going in the next part of this session as we hear from other groundbreaking members of Congress who have overcome their own stories of adversity and beat the odds to rise to the highest ranks in the U.S. government. Starting with Patty Murray, the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate from Washington State, who became the first woman to chair the Budget Committee, the first woman to chair the Veterans Affairs Committee, and that was all before taking her current helm as chairwoman of both the Senate Health Committee and the Labor, Health, and Human Services Appropriations Subcommittee. I feel tired just reading that. To Sharice Davids, the first person in her family to attend college, who juggled multiple jobs to put herself through school, from community college all the way through Cornell Law School, ultimately becoming one of the first two Native American women, along with Deb Halan from New Mexico, and the first openly LGBT Native American ever elected to the U.S. Congress. Susan Wilde, the first woman to represent Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives, who's become a brave and relentless advocate to lower drug prices, and since the loss of her longtime partner to suicide in May of 2019, an outspoken and extraordinary advocate for mental health and suicide prevention initiatives. There's Abby Spanberger, a former case officer with the CIA who had to have her service record declassified just to be able to run for Congress ultimately becoming the first woman ever to represent Virginia's seventh congressional district. And Andy Kim, the first democratic member of Congress of Korean descent, only the second Korean member overall, a first generation American born to immigrant parents who did their own fair share of overcoming adversity and working to improve the health of their communities. You should read their stories, it's amazing. <laughs> He became a Rhodes Scholar, a national security expert in the Obama administration, and ran for Congress in his home district after the previous representative became an outspoken voice to repeal the ACA and take health care away from millions of Americans. And most recently, Rep Kim became a lasting image of integrity, dignity, and democracy after being photographed on January 7th, 2021, while staying late to clean up debris from the earlier storming of the U.S. Capitol. These people are fighters, they are health champions, and they're all here today to remind us exactly what we're working for. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Senator Patty Murray, and I am thrilled to join you all for this year's Health Action Conference. I'd like to say a huge thank you to advocates who are with us today, and especially those from my home state of Washington, for your constant work fighting to make sure everyone can get affordable health care. Thank you for defending the Affordable Care Act 
for years and for helping us get the No Surprises Act signed into law. I'm also proud to be working with you towards that goal as we push to get health care provisions in the Build Back Better across the finish line because this legislation represents necessities most families have gone way too long without. Building back better means making sure healthcare is a right, not a privilege, that depends on your income or zip code. Closing the Medicaid coverage gap, extending the historic relief we passed in the American Rescue Plan will give a lifeline to families across the country who need quality, affordable coverage. Adding health care benefits to Medicare, giving Medicare the power to negotiate lower drug prices, and capping insulin costs will help countless patients get the care they need while putting more money back in their pockets. The bottom line for me is that everyone in this country should be able to get the health care they need without worrying about the cost. And I think this pandemic and economic crisis have underscored how important that is. And I know Families USA understands that as well. So I'm going to keep fighting tooth and nail to get Build Back Better passed and signed into law because families cannot afford to go another day without the critical health care coverage they need. So thanks again for all that all of you do and know you have a partner in me in the U.S. Senate pushing to get this done. Thank you. Hi everyone, Rep. Sharice Davids here. I hope you're having a good time and learning a lot at today's conference. I want to say thank you to Families USA and to all of you for continuing the fight for a better, more equitable health care system. I'm from Kansas, which is just one of a dozen states that has yet to expand Medicaid. And for years, healthcare advocates across our state have fought for expansion, have fought for the 160,000 Kansans that still need this coverage. We've gotten close, uh, only to be thwarted by former Governor Sam Brownback, uh, who vetoed Medicaid expansion. And since then, I have since I have been in Congress, I've successfully pushed for uh, an increase to the financial incentive for states to expand Medicaid. I've done that twice. Uh, but the Republican supermajority legislature uh, in Kansas continues to leave money on the table and uh, frankly, Kansans out in the cold. You know, we can't keep letting people play politics with their constituents' lives, especially during a public health crisis. That's why I've been pushing for a federal strategy to close the Medicaid gap. We have successfully uh, gotten a strategy included in the Build Back Better Act that would cover those 160,000 Kansans immediately and, and at no cost to them. So I'm gonna continue to fight for them and for the advocates and activists who have been working so hard, who have been working tirelessly to ensure that coverage for our state's uh, most vulnerable is there. I know you're gonna do that too, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing to do this with you all. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and I hope to see you all soon. Hello, Families USA. It is so wonderful to be joining so many tireless advocates from around the country who understand how critical it is to expand access to affordable health care and to improve health outcomes for people, no matter what their socioeconomic status is or their zip code. And as all of you know, the single best thing that Congress could do right now in this fight is to pass the Build Back Better Act, which would, for the first time, allow Medicare to negotiate the price of some prescription drugs and would cap the price of insulin to $35 per month and would help seniors afford the cost of their medications by capping their annual out-of-pocket cost. Lowering costs and expanding access to affordable drugs is the single biggest issue that I hear about from constituents, many of whom face financial ruin over the cost of their prescriptions and worry about their children's futures as costs continue to skyrocket. We have a huge opportunity in front of us to tackle this problem head on and to ensure that Big Pharma's bottom line isn't more important than the health of Americans. That's why I was proud to champion these provisions in the Build Back Better Act, 
why I voted to pass it in the House, and why I am urging my colleagues in the Senate to take it up as soon as possible so that we can start delivering these critical cost savings for the American people. None of this is possible without advocates like all of you who have forced these issues to be front and center. It is because of your work for a brighter healthcare future that we are so close to the finish line with the Build Back Better Act and why I am so confident that 2022 will be the year that we finally make progress in lowering the cost of prescription drugs. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you do and keep up the good fight. Thank you to Families USA for inviting me to speak with you all. I admire Family USA's commitment to building a healthcare system that provides high quality, affordable healthcare for all Americans. My name is Abigail Spanberger, and I represent 10 counties across Central Virginia, many of them very rural. And I am so excited to be joining you here today. The rural character of most of my district means that my constituents do face unique challenges in accessing affordable health care. For many of my constituents, health care costs represent a significant burden on them and on their families. And it's not right that seniors have to choose between keeping a roof over their head and or filling their prescriptions, or the families have to ration insulin to ensure that they can put food on the table. I am proud that the House passed Build Back Better Act will give Secretary of Health and Human Services, the ability to negotiate the price of prescription drugs. And I hope that as we continue these negotiations in the Senate, everyone across the board sees the incredible importance of that element of the bill. It is outrageous that seniors have to pay more than 10 times what other countries pay for the same prescription drugs here in the United States as elsewhere. And it is far past time for Congress to take action to bring these prices down. Americans should be able to afford the medicines that they need, no matter who they are or where they live or the size of their bank account. And this provision, this negotiating ability, will deliver tangible cost savings for seniors, for families, and for those living with chronic health conditions. I was proud to vote for these important provisions and see them pass through the House. I recognize how frustrating um, trying to affect change in Congress can be. But your advocacy is essential to the work that we're doing here. The advocacy that you all do, uh, the voices that you bring to Washington virtually or in person uh, help drive so much of the work that we are doing on Capitol Hill. And it keeps us motivated with the stories of the people that you're advocating for. Congress does not exist in a vacuum. It really takes the hard and the steadfast work of advocates and organizers such as all of you to make positive change occur and to keep pushing for the policies that, frankly, so many of us know are important to Americans across the country. It's valuable and it's necessary that Congress hear your voices on issues that are important to you and on pending legislation, how it may affect you, families, or the communities across the country. I thank you and I commend Families USA for your ongoing commitment to improving the health of all Americans and for your advocacy related to this very important issue. Thank you so very much for your time and for the invitation to send my greetings and say thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Congressman Andy Kim and I want to thank Families USA for pulling everyone together, for being such an incredible coalition builder. Now more than ever, we need to be looking out for the future of our health care. It's something that is having a huge impact right now when it comes to this pandemic. This pandemic has exposed the brokenness and the fragility of our system, and many people have fallen through those cracks. They have before, but we've seen it now more than ever, and it really reinforces the work that Families USA and others are doing. I wanna thank New Jersey Citizen Action for again being such an incredible partner here on the ground in New Jersey, doing everything that we can to educate and mobilize folks here to be standing up for their health care. That's the kind of action that we're going to need to be able to make the kind of change and difference that we need to. I feel it too. You know, we have a lot of great ideas out there, a lot of things that we're trying to push, and I get frustrated too about where things stand and want to see that change move faster. But I, what I can tell you is that no great change in this country has ever happened without champions both inside and outside of government working together for common cause. And that's what's happening right here. I want to work alongside you to continue to be champions fighting for this because it's the right thing to do. And it's trying to about helping people. 
helping people in the New Jersey 3rd Congressional District. And for anyone watching, please, I know that things are tough and I wanna make sure that you know we're right there with you and we need your help to make sure that this changes. But people all over the place, this is our opportunity to be able to do that. So keep up the energy, keep up the fight, and thank you for everything you've done. I think I needed that boost as much as anyone today. That was incredible. And keeping with the cute dog conversation we started earlier, did you catch Zoe the pup sleeping on the couch behind Representative Wild? I liked that uh, shout out for the dogs of Health Action Conference 2022. <laughs> Before I bring our next extraordinary speaker to the stage, let's check in on our visual note taker. You guys remember from yesterday, his incredible work. Already shaping up to be amazing and we've still got a whole session next ahead of us. That's fantastic. I'm really so glad I'm not in charge of this. I just want you guys to know that if I was to be in charge of it, uh, my version would look something more like this. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stick to policy and advocacy. I look forward to seeing what the professional has in store for us by the end of the conference. And I am thrilled to welcome our next speaker to the vir virtual stage. Congresswoman Kim Schreier represents Washington's 8th Congressional District. Prior to being elected to Congress in November of 2018, she spent her career as a pediatrician in Issaquah, Washington, working with children and helping families navigate the healthcare system. Thank you, Congresswoman, for being here. We're so happy to have you. We know as the first pediatrician here in Congress, you bring a critical voice to issues related to healthcare. And through your own experience as a patient living with type 1 diabetes, you understand the very real fear of healthcare costs and access for people living with pre-existing conditions. And as a physician who worked in a broken healthcare system, I know you understand what changes need to be made to make it work better for both patients and providers. We couldn't be more thrilled to have you here today. So thank you for making the time to be with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's truly, truly our pleasure. And before we dive into any hard hitting questions, I just wanted to start with this one. This has been a really challenging time in our country, in Congress, in the world, um, obviously with the pandemic and, and lots of changes. Even today, we're hearing out of Washington, you know, changes on the horizon to come, including the retiring of a Supreme Court justice. So I just wanted to check in with you. How are you in this moment? Oh, you're so sweet to ask. <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you, there, there's, um, there's this mix, right? I think that, especially as a doctor, I I look at how divided our country is regarding something as simple as managing COVID, wearing masks, and I find that uh, both frustrating and heartbreaking. There have been so many unnecessary hospitalizations and deaths, and this is one of those, uh, you know, we should be uniting as a country against the virus instead of dividing. But then I have to tell you on the positive note, you just heard so many of my colleagues this is the group of people I get to work with in Washington, D.C. to move the ball forward, to get health care access out there, to, to have equitable access. And so that, like, that is the North Star, and that is what energizes me along with your advocacy. Mm. It energizes me, too. I'm just, it's an extraordinary group of colleagues you get to work with. So thank you for being one of them. Um, you know, let's talk for a moment about your life before you came to Congress. So uh, as we mentioned, you're the first pediatrician, I can't believe that, but the very first pediatrician ever to serve in Congress. So you have a pretty unique background from many of your fellow representatives. I just wanted to hear from you kind of how you think that's shaped your priorities or your overall viewpoint of what government can and should do to help families. Um, well, first of all, um, I think the reason is that you don't see a ton of pediatricians in Congress is that we tend to be pretty happy in our careers and we love, love working with children and families. And so, you know, being a member of Congress in some ways is like being a pediatrician, but on a bigger scale. And I'm not talking about teaching my, my fellow members that they can't always get their way and they have to play nicely in the sandbox. I'm really talking about, um, you know, being able to serve people, sometimes in a larger way, like I can help more children from Congress than I ever could in the four walls of my exam room, I can work on things like WIC and SNAP, getting our children in school classrooms and keeping them safe there so that they can learn and their mental health develops properly. Um, and I can also, I think, reassure a lot of parents out there who are worried about 
the resiliency of our children and how they will bounce back from what two years of real difficulty for, for a lot of families. Oh my, it's so true. And actually I wanna to talk to you more in a minute about some of the policies specific to children and families that you're working on. Um, but wanted to start here too, you know, so much of the conversation around healthcare in the past several months in DC, basically all of my conversation daily, and I'm sure a lot of yours, has centered around Build Back Better, which is an extremely important bill. Um, and we're definitely gonna talk more about it, but we know Congress has also done a lot more than that. So you've been in Congress three years now, um, including this last year where there was a lot happening that maybe we've already forgotten about, memories can be short, but did you wanna you know, flag anything from the last um, three years, your first or three years in Congress that you're really proud of so far? Oh my gosh, um, where to start? Well, you know, healthcare has been my forte. And, and it, you know, what's interesting is that when I first came in, um, just to kind of rewind a little bit, uh, in January of 2019, uh, after this wave of women got elected, we had measles outbreaks across the country. Mm. And, and I just wanna just tie this connection here where I worked with the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC to work specifically on addressing vaccine hesitancy, on combating the online misinformation and disinformation, on pushing back just as powerfully as the anti-vaxxers uh, scare parents to say, like, this is the right thing to do and here's why. Um, and I see how that has gotten more legs and even more importance now in the context of COVID. So that is one of the areas where I'm proud to have worked and where I'm proud now to be a voice out there, you know, listening to parents, listening to people who are worried and being able to hear an answer um, in a very respectful way, just the way I've been doing in clinic for the past 20 years. And so, um, so that's one. Another has been to work with, with my colleagues, uh, Republican doctors, to increase access to vaccinations, to make sure that people on Medicare uh, can have access to new cutting edge therapies for four years while things get sorted out, uh, to make sure that we take care of our providers who have had such a rough time over these past several years. So um, those are some of the ways. <laughs> Well, as a human and a mother of a two-year-old, I just, I thank you very much for all that work. It is definitely a challenging time for parents. So glad to have your voice of reason here trying to help people work through it. Okay, I, I wanted to talk about another piece before we, um, you know, kind of talk about state of play. A lot of what we talk about in Build Back Better is, at least in the news, around drug pricing, ACA improvements. These are really important things, so I'm no way minimizing them. But I think one thing that happens, there's an array of really meaningful changes in maternal and child health policy that sometimes doesn't get the same billing. And we're talking about permanent CHIP funding, postpartum uh, coverage in Medicaid, some improvements from the momnibus, like a variety of really important things. Um, how do you think these house pass policies would make a difference for families? And certainly if there's anything you wanna build on here that we didn't quite make it into Build Back Better that you'd like to see Congress or President Biden address this year. Um, what a big question. Well, I know. I, if, was, <laughs> if I could point, a, Build Back Better um, is still being worked through. Um, and so hopefully, like you heard from my colleagues, you know, we need to address the high cost of prescription drugs. We need to bring down the cost of insulin. And we can talk about that in a bit. But mm -hmm. I would point to the American Rescue Plan as a marker for so many of the issues that we're pushing hard for. And this is uh, everything from bringing down the cost of plans to no more than eight and a half percent of a family's income, which for the average family in my district would essentially cut their premiums in half. It is a really big deal for people buying ACA plans. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and the, the permanent authorization of CHIP, you know, every year uh, the children's health insurance program was used as a, as a negotiating tool, mm -hmm. which is so unfair to do to children and to families to, you know, to make them a pawn in these arguments. So to have permanent funding and authorization for CHIP, that gives a sigh of relief to all the families out there who are depending on CHIP for coverage. And if I could just touch on one other thing that you mentioned, which was, you know, and it probably flew by pretty quickly when everybody heard, um, 
the idea that uh, we now cover uh, moms uh, for a year uh, postpartum on, on Medicaid. Uh, half of uh, pregnancies and deliveries in this country uh, are covered by Medicaid. And we know that that first year is a dangerous year for the moms and can be a, an, and is an incredibly impactful, important time for the developing brain and connection, emotional connection with, with a baby. And so having that year of coverage to screen for and address things like postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, if there are issues with drug use, with opiates. You know, one of the ways, this is a terrible thing, but one of the ways that women who are postpartum can die from an overdose is to be uh, not using during the pregnancy, then go back and take whatever amount they took before, um, and that is now a lethal dose. And you know, these are just some of the realities on the ground that we need to address and having that one year of coverage, whether that is for those reasons, pregnancy spacing, not smoking, you name it, um, it is critical for the mothers and for the babies. Your professional experience has clearly uh really served you well as a member of Congress. I also want to talk a little bit about your personal experience. You know, listening to you talk, I, I struggled with postpartum depression. I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have access to care. So I just, so many of us are motivated to do this work because we have been there, because we know what it feels like, and we know what it would have been if we didn't have the help we had. And you've talked in terms of your personal experience, you know, openly about a person, being a person living with type 1 diabetes and how that helps you understand other health advocates who face real fear of healthcare costs and health access concerns. So I just, you know, thought maybe give you a space with our advocates to share any words of wisdom you have. Uh, you know, people are fighting to make their voices heard. Do you have any tips for how to get those messages across with your fellow members of Congress, maybe some of whom are not as well versed in some of these issues as you are? Well, you know, I, I, what family doesn't have somebody with a pre-existing condition, right? I mean, mine happens to be type one diabetes. And I'm very open talking about it because I think that, you know, my experience in the world, um, you know, starting at age 16 with type one diabetes and living with that for, I don't, I can't do the quick math, but over 35 years at this point. Probably 20 years, 20 years, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and also as a doctor gives me this perspective where, you know, the story of my life is, is one element of that empathy and that understanding that all families have some sort of woven story like this, where they've had trouble affording a prescription drug, or they've ha had to think twice about taking their child to the doctor because of that deductible at the beginning of the year and having that visit be really not affordable. I've seen patients with conditions that would have been easy to handle had they come in early and they become much more difficult because of that fear of a, of a doctor's bill. And I think that that resonated uh, with the people who I, who I represent, who said, I, she gets it, she's been there. She's a mom, she's got this pre-existing condition and she knows the healthcare system enough to know how to dive in and help fix it. Yeah. It has been such an honor to talk with you today. I'm so thrilled that you came to join us. Are there any last thoughts you wanted to leave with folks here watching the session today? You know, we're giving everyone the charge to move forward with, I think, what is our shared vision of improved health and health equity. Just any thoughts you want to leave them with as they go out and do this hard work in the weeks and months ahead. Sure. Well, first, let me thank you for your advocacy. You know, again, I was asked recently in an interview, hey, you ran as a doctor and healthcare at that time was kind of the issue of the day. Is healthcare still an issue? And I just thought, are you kidding? Like, have you talked to any family anywhere out there who goes and fills a prescription once a month or takes their child to the doctor or worries about their elderly parent? Healthcare is one of those kitchen table issues. And so I first just want to say thank you for being advocates, for keeping this top of mind, for reminding members of Congress that this is still something that matters every single day for you. And, and as you talk with us, I just told you about how I told my story, right? What it's like to see the price of your insulin go from $40 a bottle up to over $300 a bottle for the same stuff, same measuring, no difference. That if you share your story, 
stories, whether it's about you or a family member. At the end of the day, uh, we members of Congress talk with a lot of people, but it's those stories, it's the personal narratives that stick with us. They stick in our hearts and our brains and they propel us forward. So thank you for your advocacy and that's how I would proceed. Mm. Thank you so much. I really can't thank you enough for joining us and really for everything you do every day to fight for the health of your constituents in Washington and really all of us across the country. So I hope that you stay healthy, you stay well, and just remember we are here and we've got your back. <laughs> well, thank you. I wish you all the same. And I think about, by the way, you have a two-year-old, um, the young ones and wanting to get them vaccinated and protected. And so I want to just acknowledge what is probably some anxiety on your part right now. So thank you all. Thank you for your advocacy. Amen. See, she's still being a pediatrician, even as a member of Congress and taking care of parents too. So thank totally. you, Congresswoman. What a great way to jumpstart the second day and our final day at the 2022 Health Action Conference. We have heard from a long and fabulous list of members in this View from DC uh, session. And honestly, just such a privilege to hear from Dr. Schreier. Um, but we're nearing the end of our time. We did wanna leave you with a few parting thoughts from a couple of other outspoken health champions. These are gonna be some familiar faces that you've seen doing the hard work on health advocacy in the halls of Congress and probably on the uh, television um, and really fighting the good fight. I wanted to make sure that we quickly introduce Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut, Senator Sherrod Brown from Ohio, and of course, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal from Washington State. I'm telling you, Washington advocates, you have some powerhouse women representing you in Congress, from Murray to Schreier, now Jayapal. You're doing well out there, Washington. You got something. These inspirational lawmakers, they've seen tough times before. They are not giving up on Build Back Better. And honestly, neither should we. So, so starting it's with really Senator important Murphy. that we continue to fight for the Build Back Better agenda. I know right now uh, there needs to be a new set of discussions between some of my colleagues and the White House, the rest of the Senate, to make sure that this moves forward. But the health care provisions inside the Build Back Better agenda are just absolutely critical. First and foremost, we have agreement uh, in the Senate on most of these provisions, including a provision that would, for the first time ever, allow the federal government to directly negotiate drug prices with the big drug companies. This could result in enormous savings for consumers. The system was rigged back in 2003 when the initial Medicare prescription drug bill was passed. That law actually prohibited the federal government from using its bulk purchasing power to get the best available price for the government and for consumers. But our legislation, uh, which again, agreed upon by all the Democrats in the Senate, if we ever get this in front of the Senate for a vote, would allow for that negotiation. Second, it would cap price increases on all drugs moving forward to say that companies can't gouge you by increasing the cost of a critical drug by 10 or 20 or 30 percent a year. And it would apply that protection, uh, not just to drugs being sold through Medicare, but to drugs being sold in the private sector as well. Additionally, inside the Build Back Better agenda, is continuation of subsidies for the Affordable Care Act plans so that more people can afford plans. It used to be uh, prior to uh, the beginning of this year uh, that once you hit 400% of poverty, you all of a sudden couldn't qualify for any subsidies. Well, in the American Rescue Plan, we changed that and temporarily made sure that even folks that are making a little bit over that maximum income still get some help. It made Affordable Care Act plans, Obamacare plans, accessible and affordable to millions of additional Americans. The Build Back Better plan makes that permanent. That means that a whole lot more people all across the country can be able to afford insurance. And then one of the healthcare provisions closest to my heart is a provision that would provide money to cities to try to cut down on the epidemic of gun violence, to put money in the hands of programs that surround youth, at-risk youth, with the kind of services that they need so they can avoid risky behaviors and lives that bring the risk of violence. Gun violence is a public health epidemic, so I absolutely put our efforts to try to curb gun violence in the category of healthcare prevention and healthcare provision. We gotta keep the fight on because we're not giving up on the Build Back Better agenda. Yes, it may look different than the bill that President Biden proposed, 
But we have consensus around these healthcare provisions to lower prescription drug costs, to increase the affordability of ACA plans, and to attack the public health epidemic of gun violence in our cities. And I need your help to keep up the heat. I'm Sherrod Brown. It's a privilege to serve the people of Ohio in the United States Senate. Thank you to Families USA. Thank you to President Biden and Secretary Becerra and Senator Warnock. And most important, thanks to all of you for your advocacy. Because of you, because of the work of activists and scientists, of healthcare workers and community organizers, of ordinary Americans participating in our democracy, we've made so much progress over the past year. Shots in arms, money in pockets, workers back on the job. This new variant is exhausting and real, but it's not as devastating as previous ones because of those vaccines. Businesses are back open, hiring workers. Workers are finally starting to get a little bit more power in the economy. After years of work, we're finally protecting patients from surprise medical bills, where patients would end up with out-of-control bills after a trip to the emergency room, often thousands of dollars of bills. Earlier this month, the administration followed through in its commitment to take action to lower drug costs for seniors by taking the action we called for, working to get fees charged by the middlemen, by uh, pharmacy benefit managers under control. Our charge now is to build on that progress, to not lose heart, to not underestimate what we've accomplished together, but what more we can and must achieve. It means fighting to bring down the biggest cost families face. We know so many of those costs are health care costs, from drugs to deductibles to long-term care. As we emerge from this pandemic and as we work together to build a stronger country out of this crisis, let's keep working together to build that stronger country. Last week, last week we honored Dr. King. He taught us that progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability, he said. It rolls in because of advocates like you who never give up, who dedicate your lives to creating a better, more just country. Your voices are so important in all these efforts. Thank you for staying engaged. Thank you for participating in our government. Thank you for serving our country. I'm Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, and I'm honored to represent Washington's 7th Congressional District in the House of Representatives, where I also serve as the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. As we enter the third year of this pandemic, we have seen millions of families lose their health care as the country experienced the highest increase in the number of uninsured Americans ever recorded. But the truth is that we were already leaving nearly half of all adults under the age of 65, uninsured or underinsured, even before COVID hit. And those 87 million Americans were uninsured or underinsured as we were paying more per capita for healthcare than any other country in the world. And as the economy begins to recover and people are getting back to work, these past few years have highlighted why it's so urgent that we finally guarantee healthcare to everyone in America as a human right. Healthcare with comprehensive benefits, including primary care, vision, dental, prescription drugs, mental health, long-term supports and services, reproductive care, and more. Healthcare that is without co-pays, private insurance premiums, deductibles, and other out-of-pocket costs. Of course, I'm talking about my Medicare for All Act, which we introduced this year with more than 300 endorsing organizations and more than half of the Democratic caucus already sponsoring the legislation. We're building this movement, and I have no doubt that as it continues to grow, we will make this a reality. But as we do so, as we fight this fight, we must also continue to take urgent steps to open doors for more Americans to access healthcare. That's why I'm working to expand Medicare by not only lowering the age, but also guaranteeing that it covers dental, vision, and hearing. Because last time I checked, your eyes, ears, and teeth are all part of your body, so they should be covered too. I'm proud to say that the Build Back Better Act that passed through the House includes hearing coverage and the ability for Medicare to negotiate drug prices, which will dramatically lower costs for everyone. This includes capping the out-of-pocket cost of insulin at $35 a month. This fight is long, but as a lifelong organizer, I know we are doing the work necessary to guarantee healthcare as a human right, and know that as you organize, I will be fighting right alongside you 
in the halls of Congress. Thank you so much for all you do. Let's get this done together. Thank you so much, Representative Jayapal, and to all of our speakers today and members of Congress. Thank you, Jen Taylor, for taking us through this opening session. Um, I would love to just check in really briefly with our visual note taker. So if we can scroll over there. Okay, great. Um, and no offense, Jen, I'm glad we are leaving this to the professionals and I'm really sorry to tease, but just gonna put that out there. This is what you call chemistry folks. Okay. All right, so this concludes the opening session for day two. We have a brief break. Actually, we have a longer break than I thought we would. Um, we will be back here at 2.45 Eastern for the workshop sessions. But before you break, we'd love to encourage you to, again, go to the Engagement Hub, check out the partner booths, visit with some partners. We have an amazing community. Um, take a photo at the Snap Bar. I'm seeing a lot of animals in the Snap Bar, which is wonderful. Um, but don't forget to take a picture of yourself as well. Um, reignite that fire on Build Back Better using social media and just keep building the community. We are so grateful to have you all back here for today and we will see you again at 2.45 Eastern. Thanks so much, everybody.